Hey everybody, I put it off long enough, but it's finally time to talk about the inductors. They're kind of the weird cousins of the capacitors. There are some similarities, but there's a lot of differences too. So first of all, the inductor, or sometimes known as the coil, is just that, a coil of wire wrapped around some sort of, sort of core. Usually it's a me metal of ferrous metal core. Uh, here's a couple of the different ways they can look. It's usually a coil of wire that has a coating around it. That coating is very important, so you can't let these get too hot. If that coating goes away or melts, you basically just have one giant wire going around this thing. There's no coil anymore. So it has a coating that insulates that wire, but it's very thin. You'll notice it has that core wrapping right through the center of it. Ferrous metal because it has to hold a magnetic field. Now the coil of wire, when you wrap a, when you send a current through a coil of wire, it generates a magnetic field. If that magnetic field is influencing some sort of uh, material that can hold a magnetic field, it will be much harder to develop that magnetic field because it has a lot of resistance and pushback to that happening, but it will hold that field once it's created for a whole lot longer. So one with a metal core is going to have a much higher inductance value than one that doesn't have one. Sometimes they do have an air core inductor, but metal is much more common. They have a lot of different looks, but you'll almost always, if you can see the component, you'll usually be able to recognize the coil of wire wrapped around that core. Sometimes you'll see the core itself being in a circle, and this is what they call a toroid ring. You'll see those commonly on the big audio amplifiers, really heavy ones. Yet most of that weight actually comes from a giant ring of ferrous metal, which means it has iron in it with a wire wrapped around it, toroid. Sometimes they're almost indistinguishable from capacitors. They look pretty similar. Uh, but if you are able to hold them in your hand, usually you'll feel that the inductor, since it's got that metal core, is a lot heavier. They'll also show up in one of the most common kinds of components for power transmission, the component of the, um, the transformer. The transformer is really two separate inductors. You'll notice this one has much bigger wire on one side, much smaller wire on the other side. That's really common with transformers. Uh, it has that metal ring around it, but that metal ring is not there to transmit current. No current passes through that. What actually is going on is the input side, what they call the primary coil, is creating that magnetic field because it's an inductor. That magnetic field is building up a magnetic field inside the iron core. Then that is causing there to be an induced voltage on the other side. That induced voltage is where we get the name inductor because it's inducing a voltage. Now surprisingly with transformers, the smaller wire is not the, the smaller voltage. We usually would think that. We'd say, oh, smaller wire, it's probably smaller voltage. It's the, the smaller of the two. But it's not smaller voltage that we're concerned with. It's actually the current. No power is, or very little power is dissipated or burned up by a transformer. That's why they don't get very hot, even though there's a tremendous amount of power being transmitted through it. But the smaller wire has a smaller, vo smaller current because it has a larger voltage. So the largest voltage is actually gonna have the smallest of the two wires. Bigger wires are going to have the bigger current, which means they are operating at the smaller voltage. So on most transformers, the bigger wire is actually the smaller of the two voltages, the output voltage. <clears throat> and inductors, have, they share some properties with capacitors, but they are quite different in a couple of ways. First of all, you remember back to the capacitors, we said that when you initially apply the voltage to the capacitor, a lot of current is passing through it. After a while, it's charged and the current stops. Well, the inductor, think of that as a large force that you're pushing against, like a freight train. You run up and begin pushing a freight train, or the engines in initially start up. It takes a long time to get that thing up to speed. We apply the force, but it takes a while for the motion to actually occur. Well, the force is voltage. You can apply the voltage to an inductor, but the heavier the mass is pushing back against you, the longer it's going to take for the motion or the current to start happening. So in a capacitor, current happens in immediately, even before the voltage is built up. That means that the current happens first, or we say it leads the voltage. The current leads the voltage. Now an inductor, 
the voltage is applied, but the current takes a while to catch up. So the word we use there is lag. The current lags the voltage in the inductor because you can remember that magnet, it's a force. It takes a while to build up that electromagnetic field, but it also means that it's going to stick around for a while after the voltage is removed. That can have some pretty interesting consequences and benefits too. Now another thing that sets the inductors and capacitors a little apart from each other uh, is the fact that an inductor is never just an inductor. It's got a lot of very tiny windings of wire and all that wire has resistance. It's very thin. Sometimes it can have a lot of resistance. Once you get enough of that wire wrapped around and around and around, you have a lot of resistance in that wire, relatively. So you can't just pick an inductor based on the inductance value alone if you're trying to replace a component. You must also keep in mind the amount of resistance that it has as well. Sometimes we get too focused into thinking, well, you got a resistor and you got an inductor and you got a capacitor. Each one's going to have its own separate properties, its own voltages and things like that. But the inductor is two components. It's an inductance and a resistance that you cannot isolate from each other. So you have to be very careful of that when reading it. Now, when you when you have an inductor, it's pretty easy to read the resistance on it because it's just a standard resistance meter will work. But not all not all multimeters have an ability to measure inductance. Uh, so we have a few a few methods to be able to do that. But when we get to talking later about some of the applications of these inductors, the transformer being one of them, but another very common one is to pair it with a capacitor and design what they call filters. Resonant filters use both an inductor and a capacitor to somewhat cancel each other out at particular frequencies. If we move the frequency too far in one direction, the capacitor takes over and gets a majority of the voltage in the circuit. If we go the other direction, then the inductor takes over and gets a majority of the voltage in the circuit. So only at one very specific frequency will these cancel each other out and neither one of them get the voltage. Very interesting circuits that we can deal with there with resonant filters. Uh, so this is just a brief introduction. There's a lot more about, about inductors, uh, but we'll just be looking at the very basics for now, the construction, some of the uses, and also some of the things that we want to watch out for. So stay tuned. There will be a lot more inductors coming up later.